they already have the relationships with the wealthy people that we want to meet. And so once you get them to know, like, and trust you and open up their book of business, it literally creates the opportunity to then from there raise millions and millions of dollars. Believe it or not, there are databases that'll give you access to this entire audience of people. And then you just need to be very, very strategic and very specific. The biggest mistake that I always see people make when they're starting to raise capital, if they're new at the game, is Welcome to Real Estate Syndicate Alive. I am your host, Mauricio Raul. How would you like to be able to raise $2 billion? That's billions with a B. Well, my guest this week is Brad Blazer, who has in fact raised in excess of $2 billion. Today, he mentors others around the world as part of his global coaching business on how to raise funds for high net worth individuals to build and scale your real estate projects. Some different strategies on this episode, and we touched a lot about mindset, which was really fun for me. It's an episode I really think you're going to enjoy this week on Real Estate Syndicator Live. Brad Blazer, my friend, the $2 billion man, welcome to the Real Estate Syndicator Live community. Uh, I'm glad to be here. It's a pleasure. Can you share your story, uh, Brad, of, of how you got here? And keep in mind that people really want to know how you got to the point about raising $2 billion. So as you're telling yep. us who you are, how your story will progress, keep that in mind. But uh, tell us a little bit about who you are and how did you get to the point where you're able to raise uh, that much money? Sure. No, absolutely. Um, to be real honest with your community, Mauricio, when I was growing up, I certainly did not have dreams and aspirations of being a major capital raiser or you know, known around the world as a $2 billion guy. I was actually studying architecture wanted to be an architect. And so I went off to school, like most people, you know, kind of, I guess, maybe living some of my parents' dreams, right? You know, most parents want you to be educated and go out to the world and get a job. So I went off to school. And while I was in school, I um, responded to an ad in the local newspaper. And this was for a very small oil company in Austin, Texas. I was 21 years old at the time. And I went in and the CEO just took a liking to me. He probably saw in me a little cocky, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, little kid that could think fast on his feet. And he said, look, you know, uh, I'd love to hire you. I said, great. So he said, you know, you come between classes after school and uh, we'll teach you how to get on the phone. We'll teach you a system. And so over the course of about 12 months, I was working for this very small oil company and I was only working about 12 to 15 hours a day and I was making over six figures. And I'm like, what in the world am I doing going to school so I can ultimately graduate with a degree to go out in the world and make 50, 60,000? Here I'm working 12 to 15 hour weeks, already making six figures. And so unbeknownst to my parents, I just one day turned my back to completing my schooling and went to work for a second company doing exactly the same thing. And then realized I could take some savings that I had accumulated and go off and do this myself. And so here's the funny thing. At the age of 23, lacking a college degree, I put a shingle on the door and I launched an oil company and I immediately surrounded myself with others that I needed, a securities attorney, a CPA, started hiring a team. And we built a pretty nice size oil business, raising capital drilling for oil and natural gas here in Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana. And as I like to say, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s, two major things really shook up the industry. One was obviously the Tax Reform Act that completely did away with most of the incentives for tax benefits. And then the second one was just collapsing energy prices. And so when those events came about, I slowly saw the writing on the wall and over the course of about a year, I slowly just collapsed the business. We never had to file for bankruptcy. I was completely debt free. I went back to school and I came out now with a diploma, you know, and I'm out in the workforce looking for a job. And the funny thing, looking back at this, because this was a long time ago, is people wanted to hire me and offer me salaries close to what I used to make in a good month. And I literally was just there for about a year, maybe a year and a half, just kind of bobbing around, interviewing, not wanting to go to work and sacrifice my future life based on what I had accomplished and earned up to that point. And literally the one day, it was really funny. I literally talk about this when I'm sharing stages. I was watching TV and Steve Harvey was on 
And he was talking to his audience and he said, it's my belief that everybody here in my audience has a unique gift. I call it your something special. And if you can figure out what that is and deliver it to the world where it solves a major problem, it is a magical thing. And he said, the sad thing is 97% of the people go through life and they never figure out what that is. And about two weeks later, it dawned on me that my unique skill or my hard talent was I know how to raise money better than anybody I'd ever met at that time. And I said to myself, that solves a major problem for most business owners and entrepreneurs. They need to know how to raise capital. And so I entered basically the world of financial services as the head of capital markets or the national sales director for major companies that today manage billions of dollars where we've raised money from all sources you can fathom, family offices, broker dealers, retail investors, sovereign wealth funds, you name it, pretty much I've done it. But where I really accelerated my capital raising, and this is a key, it's really this year one of the major concepts that I am coaching and mentoring on what changed my entire capital raising life was when I was in the oil business, I was raising money like most, code calling, picking up checks for 40,000 here, you know, 60, 80,000 here, we had a fund. And I had a friend of mine, Mauricio, that was a registered investment advisor. And he called me one day and said, hey, I've been kind of watching you from the sidelines and I'd like to get together and take a closer look at what you're doing. I said, great. And over the course of about two, maybe two and a half months, we opened our books and records. We showed him our fund, showed him our track record. And he said, look, Brett, I really think your fund and your program would be really suitable for some of the clients whose money we manage. And I'd like to maybe think about co-hosting an event. I said, sure. We co-hosted an event and he brought together maybe 18 to 20 of his better clients and here's the thing. He did all of the follow-up. He met with each couple. He figured out with them how much money they wanted to allocate. And over the next two and a half to three weeks, I think we raised close to $3 million. And I sat there and I said to myself, holy crap. Like, what am I doing over here code calling individuals? If I could find four to six more guys like my buddy here, it's going to five to 10x my capital raising. So that's when I went to my team, Mauricio and everybody, and I came up with this concept. And this is a big concept for everybody to understand that will be a complete game changer. It's called marketing to the one to get to the masses. We say that again, it's marketing to the one to get to the masses. And why that changed everything for me, and it's allowed me now to go and become the head of capital markets to all these big companies, is within all of our communities, there are small little boutique registered investment advisory or private wealth management firms. And they already have the relationships with the wealthy people that we want to meet. And so once you get them to know, like, and trust you and open up their book of business, it literally creates the opportunity to then from there raise millions and millions of dollars. And so what I want everybody here to realize is that while you're focused on retail high net worth, start reaching out to some small boutique RIAs. Start meeking out to those guys to build a relationship. Now, of course, you need a little bit of a track record. You need to have been at this for a while like we were, but that was the big game changer very early in my career that set me on the path to really know how to scale and raise literally hundreds of millions. And in my case, over $2 billion for multiple companies. That's awesome. And do you end up partnering with the RIAs or how, how, does, that, how does that business relationship work? Yep. So understand that registered investment advisors are very different than broker dealers or registered reps. Um, when you're working in the broker dealer space, most registered reps with broker dealers, they get paid a commission. And so when you look at the sponsors that distribute offerings through the broker dealer space where you've got registered reps and financial planners, it's not uncommon to see that these guys are sometimes getting a six or 7% commission, right? RIAs are very different. Registered investment advisories, their whole model is they're fee-based. And so they're getting paid by their clients based on the AUM. 
Usually it's in a range of one to one and a half percent. So if a client goes to a registered investment advisor and says, hey, here's my portfolio, and that portfolio's value is a million dollars, the RIA will say, well, that's great. We will manage that money for 1% a year, and we bill you on a quarterly basis. So when you look at your capital stack as a syndicator, you're not paying a commission to a registered investment advisory firm. They're already getting paid directly by the client. All it becomes is an allocation within that client's portfolio so that now they have exposure to basically alternative investments. And I love that. And I just love the concept. I didn't, I didn't actually know about it until you talked about it earlier this morning in one of your posts, but that the whole concept of just making life much easier when you're just talking to one person. I, I like to, you know, I do, the, to be honest with you, I do something very similar in my practice. Obviously it's a different context, but it's, I call them sort of gatekeepers or sometimes I don't like to use the word influencer because influence can mean a lot of things, but somebody who's already yep. got in my world, somebody who's already got an audience in your world. Somebody who's already got clients, high net worth individuals who are looking to place capital getting into relationships with them because it's a win-win. You get the capital and they, they get to allocate the capital and get that fee from their clients. So I think it's just a brilliant, a brilliant uh, way to do things. Absolutely. You know, and think about, you know, any one of us here, would you rather have an offering where you're co-calling and you're hosting events and you're just going through that, I, what I call mental brain damage or literally over the course of maybe 12 to 18 months, finding six to eight small registered investment advisors where, you know, every six to eight weeks you're hosting an event, they're doing all the follow-up, they're meeting with the clients, they're determining with the clients how much money each family wants to deploy. And you just sit back and of course this money just, you know, keeps coming in to me. That's working both hard and smart, but that's really where my life changed. And I realized I wanted to create distribution. I wanted to create relationships with those people that could dramatically enhance what I could theoretically do on my own. Yeah. And, I, and I'd also love something you said earlier too, which is, you know, as you're continuing, because a, a lot of folks are either just starting and it just as you're continuing to raise for you, your retail investors to sort of start on the side. There's no reason it has to be one or the other. You can do both. You can continue yeah. to do what you're doing now while you start reaching out. You know, you're not to do it full time, but just a little bit right. by a little bit, starting to do one event a month, one event a quarter, and then then you can get you ramp that up. There's no reason to do one or the other, right, Brad? Absolutely, 100%. I always tell people, you know, don't quit doing what you're doing uh, because it will work or it is working. But just start basically understanding that this concept, this thing that I did and that many of my top students are doing now with tremendous success called marketing to the one to get to the masses, you know, we can help you locate these RIAs. Believe it or not, there are databases that will give you access to this entire audience of people. And then you just need to be very, very strategic and very specific. And when I mentor people, I say, look, in the RIA community, you got the big billion dollar companies. More than likely, they're not going to do business with you. But you have a lot of these small, what I call boutique RIAs, where they might be two guys, three guys that used to be registered reps at a big wirehouse like a Merrill Lynch or a UBS Payne Weber. And they get to a point in their career where they're making a couple hundred grand. And the light bulb goes off and they're like, why in the world are we paying 40% of our commission revenue to the house? Well, that's a lot of money. Why don't we just break away, start an RIA, cost us $15,000, $20,000 to create a document we call our ADV. It's a disclosure document. There are other companies out there that will help facilitate this process. And they become a registered investment advisory firm. And as some of you may or may not know, when you start an IRA and you're just getting started, when your asset base is below 100 million, you're registered to the state that you're based in. And then once your assets get to 100 million or an amount greater, your registration moves over to the SEC. But now, you know, they're fee-based advisors. They can charge their clients one of three ways, obviously based on AUM. Another is by the hour, much like an attorney or much like a CPA. And then they can also, on a discretionary basis, charge a small fee. And we typically call this a due diligence fee. So if I were an RIA and a client came to me with a deal, I could say, look, for $500, I'll read through the offering memorandum. I'll get on a couple calls with the sponsor. 
make sure that we do the proper due diligence. But by and large, these guys are not commission driven. They don't work like stockbrokers. They don't look like they don't work like registered reps at the broker dealer. So I tell people, if you want to raise money, go there first begin building the relationships with the RIAs. And then after a while, you know, you can talk to broker dealers, but working in the broker dealer community is a whole <laughs> different ball wow. game because now you have FINRA involved and FINRA mandates that broker dealers conduct their due diligence a little differently. No, absolutely. That's, I love it. Uh, Braden had a question uh, that I had as well, which is, do you approach your capital raising differently if you're talking to a retail investor versus a, a family office or, you know, a, a broker dealer, or just depending on the type of investors that you're attracting, is, is, does your strategy change at all? It does and it does not. Um, that's a great question. And so uh, let me break that down a little bit. The biggest mistake that I always see people make when they're starting to raise capital, if they're new at the game, is they don't understand that building trust takes time. And so you'll meet somebody that has a considerable amount of wealth and you'll start talking about your deal or you'll start talking about your big idea, typically on the very first and sometimes in the second call or the second meeting. And usually what happens, and this is why a lot of people really struggle to raise capital. It's kind of like they're on a treadmill and I break it down. And they say, man, we're talking to a lot of people. We're just not closing anybody. What's happening is the other person will say something like, Dan, send me the information. It sounds like it's a pretty interesting deal, but they're saying it really more out of respect and because that's just the natural progression of events. And so you send them everything, you follow up, but then you don't close. And what that person is really subconsciously saying is you did not give me enough time on the front end of this relationship to really get to know you don't know your values, don't really know that you'll treat me as a fiduciary. Had you invested more time up front, I'd be much more inclined to be moving forward in this process with you. But here's the difference. Retail investors, like the doctors, the entrepreneurs, the business owners, while they might be sophisticated and accredited, they're not professional, meaning they're not a family office. They're not an institution like a pension fund. Those higher groups will do much greater amounts of due diligence. They're going to look for things within your business, like do you have an accounting understanding or do you have an apartment controller? Do you have compliance? Do you have investor relations? And in the industry, there are actually firms that are set up that do conduct professional due diligence, like my friends at Mick Law or at Fackright or at Bottonwood. And these are third party due diligence firms that are engaged often enough by the family offices or by the broker dealers that will come in and really do a deep dive on you and your company where they'll do things like Lexus Nexus background checks. They'll check basically for pr prior bankruptcies or things like that, because you have to realize in the securities business, an omission of something that is a material fact is just as bad as basically fraud, because if by omitting that material fact would have induced an investor to make a different decision, it ain't a good thing. Right. So what they try to do in this due diligence process is really learn as much about you, Brandon and Mauricio, as they can, either through that due diligence process that is pushed out to third party firms or in a much, much deeper dive. Whenever we work with family offices or larger groups, we literally walk in or we send them access to a Dropbox file that goes much, much deeper than just a PPM, a pitch deck, and a one pager. It's got things like articles of incorporation, bios on the key principle, copy of our key man coverage, assuming you have that, all of these other things that these larger groups would want to see because I've been doing this long enough now to know exactly what they look for. And we want to give all that to them right up front so that they don't have to continually be coming back to us and asking every couple of days. Yeah. The thanks for that. Great, great answer. And you, you touched about something that I wanted to touch on. So um, I'm going to, I'm going to dig a little bit deeper on that because you often talk about some of the biggest mistakes that you see, you know, capital raisers make. And one of them is, I think you call it premature pitching. Right. Yeah. It's something where, and so I know you've got some sort of, uh, I think you've got a blueprint for that, but can you talk a little bit about 
why premature pitching is a mistake uh, and, and first maybe define what exactly in your word is, is a premature sure. pitch, but then why that, why, that's one of your big mistakes that you always often see syndicators make. So I think what's made us in our platform um, very successful in seeing success with many of our students is I've taken, you know, roughly 30 years of knowledge, everything I've done right, everything I've done wrong, certainly everything I've seen other people do right and wrong. And I've been able to codify that knowledge and really pare it down to what I call key pillars or key concepts. So you often hear me talking about things like the four-step blueprint. Now, Jordan Belfort, the Wolf of Wall Street, that's one of the greatest closers and certainly also a phenomenal sales trainer, uses something very similar to my four-step blueprint. He just calls it the straight line process. But it is a process that once it's understood by somebody else can then be used as a concept. You hear me talk about the trust sequence, the validation phrase, this concept marketing to the one to get to the masses. Because one of the things that I learned through my business coach is when you can create concepts, a concept can be given to somebody else. And once that other person grasps and understands that concept and then implements that into their business, that's where they're gonna start having success. That's where they'll start seeing results. And so understanding that raising capital is much like dating. You know, you don't meet a woman and then walk her down the aisle and get married after the first date. You have to understand that building trust in somebody takes time. And so this concept I often talk about called the trust economy, it is a six step process. It starts with perception. When you meet an investor, they're evaluating you in the first minute, deciding if there's ever going to be a second date. And then you go to the temptation phase where you're asking questions. You're getting to know that other person. You're going deep with them. You're telling them right now, I don't have an investment really that I can discuss with you. And then after that, you start building the connection. And then you get to the validation phrase. And the validation phrase is the most important part really in the raising of capital because until you validate subconsciously that that person trusts you, if you pitch, you might be wasting your time. You might be doing it too early. And so usually at the very tail end of my second interaction with someone, I'll just say something very casually like, Michael, you know, like I've told you all along right now, I just don't have a deal that I can really discuss with you openly. And the reason is I like to give my existing investors the right of first refusal. And as a result of that, my deals tend to fill up pretty quickly. But here's what I'd love to do. I keep a list of people, Michael, on my desk that have expressed interest. And I'd love to add your name to that list so I can give you a call in the future in the event I have an opening on something I think you can get real excited about. Would that be okay with you? You see, and when Michael or whoever I'm talking to says, yes, please do that, really what they're subconsciously saying is I trust you enough to move forward in this process to the next step. You have to understand, all of us here, that raising capital is essentially sales 101. We're selling ourselves, we're selling our business, we're selling the deal. And with that, there is a big difference between being basically a salesperson or being a closer. Salespeople flirt, closers close, and closers understand things like sales psychology, how to ask for the order, how to overcome objections. And so by being a better closer and understanding some of these, I won't call them psychology things, but really they are based on psychology and just the way the mind processes data, you can become a much, much better capital raiser because understanding the flow of the blueprint, the trust sequence, the validation phrase, you start to realize that's the mistake I've been making all this time. I've been pitching my deal too early in this process. Right. And I love, I love what you just said about not having a deal. Cause I've always talked about how the best time to raise capital is when you don't have a deal. Cause there's just 100%. no pressure. Yep. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Take the pressure off the other person, disarm them right up front. And there's actually some psychology in this people that are salespeople, doesn't matter whatever industry it is that you're selling. They know the takeaway close is the most powerful selling concept in the the, 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 the selling industry. It's basically telling somebody, William, I really don't need your money that bad because people like to invest in people that they perceive are successful, just like banks like to loan money to people that technically we all say don't need your money. But if you basically take the attitude, some will, some won't, so what? 
there's always going to be somebody else for me to be talking to. That investor is going to have a sense of comfort when you take a back seat and just say, look, right now, I don't have something that I can discuss with you. When I do, be more than happy to reach out. But then when you do approach that person with a tremendous amount of enthusiasm and excitement, because it's like holding a diamond, you've got an opportunity that can make that person a lot of money. But while you're talking about the investment, always be talking about the benefits of what this investment will do for the other person rather than the features. People at the end of the day want to know what, what will this do for me? A hundred percent. Let's go back to the RIA because James was asking a question. Um, most, well, maybe all or most folks in this community are real estate capital raises, real estate syndicators, uh, mm -hmm. are, are registered investment advisor, RIAs, accustomed to having real estate people reach out to them? Or is this something specifically related for you know private equity or venture capital or some other form of uh, capital raising? No, absolutely, 100%. Um, I think most of the RIAs that I've worked with and certainly that you know we have called on over many, many years, they love real estate as an asset class uh, because it's not correlated to the broader market. It falls in that bucket of alternative investments. And, um, you know, a lot of these RIAs that move out and leave the major firms like the Merrill Lynch's or the Payne Weber's of the world, a lot of times they did not have access to private real estate there. They may have had things like real estate investment trust or ETFs, but understand that that exposure to real estate is largely correlated to the broader stock market. So if the market starts going down, you know, those real estate investments will go down right along with them because there is a big difference between public real estate and private real estate. Once they get out over here and they're like, holy cow, there's this whole new world of products that we didn't have access to back at the other firm. They really do adopt that and embrace that. And one thing that I've learned over the course of the last 20 years is a lot of these RIAs, the way they allocate capital is based on something called the endowment theory. And you can actually Google this, everybody. It's called the endowment theory. It is a model of investing. And so when you look at the most successful endowments like Harvard, Yale, all these major um, endowments, their investment portfolio looks like a pie. And there's all these different slivers, real estate, international, domestic equities, oil and gas, private equity, et cetera. And so, you know, they're allocating to these different sectors. And most RIAs look at that and allocate capital the same way because they know as a registered investment advisory firm, if we adhere to the quote traditional wirehouse model of you know 60% equities, 30% bonds, 10% cash, and we go into a major bear market, that client's portfolio is going to take a huge hit. We don't want a portfolio, you know, that's going like this, especially for somebody that's close to or at retirement. We want just very predictable, steady growth. And so by allocating to things that are not correlated, they get that steady, predictable growth of 8, 10, 12% a year. Because as they like to say, when some investments are zigging, the others are zagging. And so RIAs are very, very receptive to real estate, especially commercial real estate. Thanks. That was great. Um, and guys, if you have questions, put them in the chat. Uh, Dan, Dan was asking whether, what exemption do you typically rely on, Brad? Is, do you do a lot of, by primarily 506Cs or do no. you do 506Bs? What do you, what's your, what's your uh, exemption of choice? <laughs> so we probably like you recommend Mauricio, the 506B uh, for the majority of things that we're involved in. And also for the majority of people that we do work with. Um, and it's really just, you know, Number one, you can leverage social media. You can certainly advertise as long as all of the investors are accredited investors at the end of the day. Brad, you, but, meant, you, meant, you meant C then. I know you said C at the beginning. Oh, so yeah, 506C, yeah, C, yeah. right? Yeah, 506C, yeah. yeah. But, but what a lot of people overlook that, you know, go out there uh, with a B is that if you do go the B route because you got some friends and family or, you know, you, you want to bring in some uh, non-accredited uh, investor capital, two things happen. Number one is the disclosure standards go up dramatically. You have to have far more disclosures in your uh, documents. But the other is that the regulatory uh, bodies that oversee the securities industry want you to have basically accounting standards that are representative or comparable to a public reporting company. So your accounting standards have to go up considerably to bring in those non-accredited investors. And typically what that implies is audited financial statements. And so for a lot of people that are getting started 
that is a huge expense financially to overcome and more importantly, just a huge hurdle to overcome in terms of the bookkeeping and being able to set up your infrastructure to just report to what ultimately might be a small handful of non-accredited investors. So we always advise everybody we work with, you know, go the reg D route, do the 506 C and just focus on accredited investors. Now, certainly we coach people that do reg A's, you know, and that do EB fives and, you know, all of the other stuff as well. But we always tell people, make your life simple and easy. Just do the reg D 506 C. A hundred percent. Um, is it harder, Brad, these days? I mean, that's the consensus, right? That it's harder to raise capital today. Uh, how are you navigating through that? Because, um, well, first of all, do you agree with that? Is it harder to raise capital today? And if it is, how are you navigating that? You know, <laughs> it, it's like Zig Ziglar says, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're going to be right 100% of the time. I think what's happening, Mauricio, is a lot of people are buying into the noise. And they're going into investor meetings and investor meetups with that mindset. And so as a result, they're already somewhat sabotaging the outcome. Uh, to be real honest with you, there's plenty of money out there. And you have to basically just block out the noise and continue doing what you're doing because many of the people we're working with are raising tremendous amounts of capital. They're telling us they're getting money coming in each and every week. And so I think really what you have to do is just stay very, very focused and not buy into that mindset. You know, certainly with interest rates above where they were, you know, two years ago. Yeah, we all know that lending is more expensive. We all know that sellers maybe haven't come down on their ask. But at the end of the day, investor sentiment is still pretty healthy. And I think that in any market we're in, it doesn't really matter what market we're in there are always going to be people that are looking for the three big things that real estate offers tax benefits, cash flow, and capital appreciation. And so if you can talk eloquently about all of those three things, you're going to be able to win investors over nine out of 10 times. But it's understanding that as you're building that relationship, the first thing you want to really do in both your first and second call is be asking people lots of questions. The best capital raisers are literally the best listeners. So we ask people questions as we're getting to know them. Like, you know, Angel, tell me about the best investment you've ever made. And just listen. Great. Like when you do invest, what are you looking for? Are you looking for income? Are you looking for capital appreciation? Are you looking for tax benefits? What are you, what are you looking to do with your investment capital? And listen, because when it comes time to close that investor, what you learned in what I call that discovery phase will actually help you because then you can tie in your close to what you learned up front and say something like, Tyler, do you remember when we were first talking, you told me that you wanted your money to grow so that you could put your kids through school in a couple of years. Can you see how this investment will do that for you? We're projecting a two and a half to three X on this over the next five to seven years. And by tying, like I said, basically the benefit of what the investment does to that person's investment goals, now there's alignment. Now they're much more willing and desirous of moving forward because they can see exactly how that investment opportunity will benefit them. And I a lot of people overlook doing that. They just never think to tie the benefit of what the investment tangibly does to specifically what the investor is ultimately looking to do. I love that quote that you had that that you basically just said, which is the best capital raisers are the best listeners, which is just a great oh, quote. One, one, of my, one of my favorite quotes, that might be my new quote for this year. My One of my favorite quotes from last year, uh, which was uh, from Russ Gray, who, who said it on this podcast too. He said he he he, he ripped off, the, not ripped off, but he, uh, he took the John F. Kennedy quote and he said, ask not what the capital can do for you, <laughs> ask what you can do for the capital, which is essentially what you just said, listen more than you speak. Absolutely. And, you know, I think that all of us here have to be very cognizant of that because even just coaching my sales team, when we listen to the replays, I stopped them and I said, did you get that very subtle buying signal? No, let me play it again. Oh, now I heard it. You talked right over that. Like I would have gone right to, if that works for you today, Mauricio, let's go ahead and get you onboarded. What does this look like for you? A lot of us just talk right over the close. 
And when you ask somebody to invest with you, there is a right way to do this in a wrong way. Psychology has proven that when you give people the ability to say no, 90% of the time, they will not choose that option. And so a lot of us here, when we're doing our syndications or when we're doing our funds, as we know, we got, you know, our minimum investment is $50,000 per share, or our minimum investment is, you know, $25,000 per unit. And so when I close people, I always give them the ability to say no. And typically what I'll say is, Mauricio, you know, now that I've answered all your questions, how much of this particular fund do you see yourself wanting to take today? Do you see yourself doing one unit, two units, three units? Or of course, you can always do no units. And then I just stop talking. And that person may not talk for 30 to 45 seconds because they're rehashing in their mind everything that we discussed over the course of that conversation. And usually what happens eight out of 10 times is they'll come back and they'll say something like, well, tell me again, what do two units in your program represent? And once I answer that question, I follow up and I say, is that something that you're comfortable with today? And if they say yes, I go, great. And I go right to the close. Yeah, now we're talking about now we're talking my language. I absolutely love, you know, mindset and and, and philosophy. So I, I'd like to dig in. I was going to dig into your, your personal philosophy. Um, you know, how how is this mindset of yours and personal philosophy contributed to you getting to this 2 billion? Because I know you talk about stuff like beef. I think it's called beliefology is, is a term that you use. I mean, talk a little bit about your mindset and how that's helped you get from, you know, where you started to where you are today. Yeah, we've actually got a federal trademark on this. It's called The Art of Beliefology. And I actually write about that in my first book on the Wings of Eagles, which is largely a motivational success mindset type book, understanding that your success in life is largely driven by your belief system. And your belief system obviously drive and dictate your habits, right? And so, you know, understanding that things that become habitual, where you do them every day, take time, it's the understanding that in order to have positive change or transformation in one's life is you have to create the habits that over time will foster the new belief. And then that, of course, brings about the, the transformation. But it's a phrase that I developed that we actually trademark called the art of beliefology. But I think that, you know, so many people go through life wanting to do something big in life. And they typically get stuck. And a lot of times it's just due to the fear and the limiting belief. And I actually hired a coach a few years ago, one of the top coaches out there, my good friend, Coach Michael Burt. And he said, look, I've shared the stage with some of the biggest names in the world, you know, Grant Cardone, Tony Robbins, Ed Milep, Brad Lee, you know. And he said, what I have observed being around these people is they block out the noise. They don't listen to the thoughts of others. They don't buy into the thoughts of others. They're just so laser focused. And once I understood that concept, I started doing things in life that would normally scare the shit out of most people. Like, for example, I was invited to speak at an event about a year and a half ago alongside Floyd Mayweather and uh, Brandon Dawson, of course, that Grant Cardone's business partner at 10X, uh, hip hop musical artist, Rich the Kid, Jesse Itzler, all these big names. And I went to my wife and I said, I'm going to show up there in my own private jet. First time I ever flown in a private jet. She said, you have any idea? how much this is going to cost you? I said, I have no idea. I just figured, you know, a couple thousand bucks. So I started calling around. It was $35,000 round trip from Houston to Miami, Florida. And she's sitting there going like, who are you trying to impress? I'm like, I'm not trying to impress anybody. Here I am flying down there to speak alongside some of the biggest names in the world. And this will do something inside me because once I do that, it will activate something that will motivate me now to attain a much, much higher level of success. And so I told the charter company, send me the contract. I signed it. And she's going ballistic, like $35,000, like are you an idiot. But here's the thing. I committed to do something big. And then the solution presented itself. I realized that Jet had nine seats. And so I went to my social media and I basically promoted the other seven seats. And I said, hey, I'm flying to an event. If you want to be in the VIP and get a chance to have your photo taken with Floyd Mayweather and Brandon Dawson and Jesse Itzler, I sold the other seats basically in about four days and I ended up flying for free. And since that time, we've done multiple masterminds in the sky, but that's how a lot of people that have a social presence and a following can literally fly on a private jet at a fraction of the cost of what it would cost to traditionally fly first class 
or in many cases actually fly for free. See, commit first, the solution will always present itself. Um, and so, you know, it's just blocking out the noise. I didn't listen to my wife. I made the decision and there we go. That's also Jeff is saying, whatever the mind of the man can conceive and believe it can absolutely achieve. And I think, uh, we, we all agree with that. Um, let's talk a bit about technology, Brad. I know you've been, mm -hmm. yep. I, I think based on the color of your, your beard and the color of my hair that we've been doing this for a while. So, uh, how is, how has technology changed things? Are you doing things differently today than you were, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, or, or does that have a, a, a significant impact on how you're doing things? It's huge, uh, you know, with the Jobs Act and obviously, uh, you know, the creation of that and how they loosened their restrictions on solicitation. Uh, it is a whole new game. You know, now we can do funnels, we can do webinars, we can set up evergreen systems. Uh, it's really dramatically enhanced people's ability to raise capital that understand this and really also understand what it means to become what I call a person of interest. Uh, you know, as you can see here, you know, we got our podcast, Capital Catalyst Show, where we interview people that have successfully raised capital, um, syndicators. Uh, I've been interviewed on radio, TV, obviously written multiple books and authored articles. It's always much better when you're raising capital to be on the receiving side of inquiries where people are calling you wanting to invest or wanting to know more rather than being the person that's the pursuer. Okay, let me say that again. It's very challenging to raise capital when you're cold calling, when you're pursuing, when you're doing outreach. I would much rather be sitting back in my office and have people calling me and saying, hey, Brad, I saw you on so-and-so's podcast last week. I wanna know more about your real estate fund. Or, hey, I just bought your book. And at the end of your book, there was some information about you're also in real estate. I'd like to get more information. You see, those leads as they come into my business are much, much warmer leads because that prospective investor has already, to some extent, made the decision that they want to know more about how they can invest with me. And so it's in what I call becoming a person of interest. It's somebody that others start to follow where you can then monetize that community. And like Paula said, it's really building your brand. Everybody here needs to realize you are your own brand. And let me tell you something about real estate. This is huge. I worked as the head of capital markets for one of the most brilliant guys that I've ever worked with in real estate uh, out in California. He is the CEO and founder of a company called SmartStop. He started off in self-storage, okay? SmartStop was a large self-storage operator, one of the top five or seven in the United States. And when I was working with him, he went to market to sell his portfolio. We had a real estate investment trust, had basically put together and built a portfolio of about $400 million in assets. And the very first company that called him was CubeSmart. And CubeSmart said, hey, you know, we've heard you're in the market looking to create liquidity for your investors. So they flew him up. And so Michael went up there. They did the whole dog and pony show. And shortly after, they received an all-cash offer for 900 million bucks. Okay, he said, as a fiduciary, I've got to go talk to my board of directors. I've got to sit back and we've got to analyze this offer. We'll get back to you. Subsequently, a couple of days later, Extra Space, another big operator, called them, said, "Hey, we hear that you're in the market." Went through the same dog and pony show. A couple of days later, 1.3 billion. $400 million difference, everybody. Okay, now he's sitting there thinking to himself, what in the heck do these people see that these other idiots missed? Like if it was 10 or 20,000, I mean, 10 or $20 million, I wouldn't be thinking this, but they saw something that the others obviously missed. And so in his follow-up with extra space, he asked them, he said, look, we got other offers we're entertaining. What is it you see in the value of our portfolio and what we built here that maybe some of our competitors have overlooked? And the chairman of the company said, Michael, we're not buying the portfolio. We're buying the brand. We're buying everything that name stands for in the self-storage industry. As an example, with extra space, what are the colors on every single door of every property we own and operate in the United States? He said, green. He said, exactly. And what about public storage? Orange. He said, with your company, it's blue. He said, we're paying you for the brand, not for the real estate, you idiot. 
And he realized that that brand was worth an extra $400 million, just like the Apple on the back of my Mac is worth a hell of a lot more than all of the computers or the swish on the Nike tennis shoe is worth more than Nike. It's the brand. And so as you guys are building your real estate portfolio, build the brand and what it stands for. Because when you go to create liquidity for your investors, if you do what we call the portfolio sale, where you sell a couple of properties at a portfolio, you will actually get a significant premium in the marketplace when you exit by selling the brand, not the real estate. And speaking of brand, one of the, I think we all agree, one of the best ways to do that is to put on these events or have your podcast and do that stuff. So let's talk about your your event that's coming up in Miami. That's how we originally connected, right? So you're, you, you do a couple of these every year, right? Um, in 2023, Mauricio, we did, I think it was six, maybe seven, which was wow. a lot of boot camps. Um, you know, I've gone to Fun Lunch and I've gone to a lot of these big events and we've surveyed literally hundreds of people. And, and what we have found is in a learning environment where you're delivering content and your purpose is to educate, not to dive the big rah-rah, you know, sign up for this, sign up. No, it's to educate. We find that a smaller event of between 60 and 100 people really work much better. There's better networking. There's better learning. Uh, it's more intimate. And so this year we will do four events. We're gonna do our first one in Miami. Uh, that's the one of course that you'll be at on the 23rd and 24th of February at the beautiful Hilton Hotel. Then we'll do another one uh, that'll actually be in um, uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. And then our third event, which will be in um, August, will be in Nashville, Tennessee. And then we'll end up the year back here in Houston, Texas. So we'll do kind of what I call four very intensive very focused capital raising boot camps. And at these boot camps, fully educational, as you know, we're going to have yourself there with another securities attorney talking about all the rules and regs and securities 101. We'll have a multifamily and a syndication group there with three major allocators and three major um, uh, multifamily uh, syndicators that in the aggregate manage probably close to a billion dollars uh, in real estate. My new friend, Seth Ferguson, who hosts the largest real estate event in Canada called the Multifamily Investor Conference. Uh, this year, he's having Elena Cardone, Jordan Belfort, Robert Herchevec, myself, and other, other speakers. Biggest event, 5,000 attendees, he'll be there. But its focus is not on you know, how to underwrite real estate. Its focus is how do you raise capital? Like how do you build distribution? How do you launch a fund? How do you do all these things that everybody here on this webinar are here to do, but really most importantly, it's do it the right way, you know, do it the easy way. Um, and I know in the position you're in Mauricio, certainly the one I'm in, we talk to so many people that are infringing, you know, on the rules and regulations. Uh, and it's because they don't know what they don't know. And uh, I tell them, man, you can't be paying a commission. You can't be doing this. You got to be doing it this way because it only takes one bad apple, i.e. a bad investor to lodge a complaint with the regulatory body and you're done. Like I heard a horror story with one of the students we now work with where he lives in California. He had been raising money and he was calling investors in Arizona and an accredited investor that was fairly knowledgeable like me called the Arizona State Securities Board to find out if he had notified them and filed his blue sky, which of course he had not done because he didn't know he had to. And so what do you think happened? They went to his website, they sent him a cease and desist. And from there, they went to him and said, you have to give all of the investors basically a right of rescission because you sourced the capital improperly. And it just opened a whole can of worms. And he's literally now spent thousands of dollars in legal defense, going back to investors, you know, trying to put a Band-Aid on something that easily could have been prevented. So for those of you that are new to this, that really feel that you need to know the, the, the rules of the game. I call it Securities 101. That's why Mauricio's here. That's why he'll be at the boot camp. That's why you should consider coming to the boot camp. It's to make sure that while you're in the securities industry, you're going about this process, but more importantly, you're going about it the right way. Yeah, and I just dropped the the link uh, in the chat, but it's such a it's such a issue that's near and dear to my heart as well, Brad. But obviously, because I'm a, I'm the securities attorney, but there's just so many people that are doing this improperly, which 
not only drives me crazy, but it also is concerning because once the cat's out of the bag, you can't put that bag yeah. back in. And so what's going <laughs> to happen, here's what's going to happen. And this is my biggest concern is that, you know, we haven't had a major, major, major downturn in a long, long time, over a decade. And right. when that happens or as that's, and it's starting to happen, by the way, it is starting to happen. Uh, you'll start realizing, oh crap, what I did was not compliant. Oh crap. I wasn't supposed to be having so many co-GPs or paying commissions when I wasn't supposed to. And at that point, there's nothing you could do. There's not something like, yeah. well, let's stop doing that. And now, now I've learned my lesson. It, it, so now it's going to just be a matter of time as, as everyone catches you. So that's yeah. why I love that you're doing the, the boot camp, And I love also why you have your, your capital school. Talk a little bit about the capital school and then I let you go. Cause I know uh, we, we've gone a little bit over and I really appreciate your time, but tell the folks a little bit about your yeah. capital school and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Sure. Well, you know, we've got probably one of the largest educational platforms today, teaching people how to attract and raise capital. We're a complete one-stop shop for anything and everything related to capital. Um, we have different levels, of course, based on your needs, but it's really focused. And today we're in 28 countries around the world is how to teach people how to attract, how to raise and how to close capital at any level. It does not matter where you are, whether you're a new beginner or whether you're fairly seasoned, you got to realize I have raised capital from every source you can fathom, family offices, institutions, sovereign wealth funds, pensions, retail investors. And so many of the people we work with already have hundreds and millions of dollars. And what we're doing for them is we're building distribution with broker dealers. We're, we're building a platform with RIA so that they can quickly scale and start building these networks, much like I've talked about earlier in the call. But the whole capital school uh, platform is really a one-stop shop. We can do everything from launching your funds. Uh, we can work with some of the securities attorneys we have relationships with, crafting the fund documents, doing your pitch deck, doing your one-page fund summary. Uh, we can obviously open doors to family offices. I'm going to be at a big event next week in Dallas, Texas, with many of my students in front of professional athletes, RIAs, family offices. And then I'll be at another one again in Scottsdale. So really everything we do is just built around the attraction of capital, teaching people how to raise more capital. And many of you here that are on the call today are probably proficient and good already. You've had a degree of success. And I kind of equate myself to the Tim Grover in the sports coaching world, right? Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan, hire Tim Grover. They're already great athletes. The difference is you want to be good or you want to be great. Because if I can take some people that are already raising money and get you to raise 20 to 30% more with some new ideas or just better skills, how many millions more does that translate to over the next 12 to 18 months? But you can check it out on my website. Yeah, there it is right there. Mauricio just put it in the chat, our capital school. And, uh, you know, go to my website. It's just bradblazer.com. My first and last name is spelled without any E's in it. And, uh, you know, you can look at my books. Uh, a lot of people, of course, have read my book, Winning at the Capital Game. A lot of people, of course, have come to the boot camps. But what I would invite all of you to do is just reach out to me through social media on Instagram, send me a DM, or go to my website, to my contact page, and just basically say, man, I just want to get on a quick clarity call with you. I want to tell you where I am, where I'm trying to go and figure out how you guys might be able to help get me there. And that's, you know, I think certainly something that we would love to do with any one of you here, because we have a lot of tools and a lot of resources that have really helped people scale their business and raise a ton of money and more importantly, do it the right, the structured and the legal way. If you'd like to join us live on these episodes and have a chance to get your specific question answered, you can simply go to realestatesyndicatorlive.com and register to be live on the show. Hope to see you then.